what a backdrop, huh? <laughs> like, I mean, this is good, but that was great. So I, you can't compete with those vibes. I mean, the wind was rough, but the, the view, well, the view was good. And today, uh, I brought the big guns today. I've, this is, this is, yeah, this is, this is a big one here. We're, we're just jumping in because uh, it's throwback time. We're in the book of Genesis and we got to dig into the book of Genesis. And um, so I'm excited about what God is going to do today. You know, and I'll, I'll tell you this. This is the first time I have spoken in front of live bodies since March 8th. So, you know, we've done a few different creative things. So this is going to be good. So either it's going to be really long uh, or I'm going to use all of my great content within the first five minutes because I'm so excited. And, uh, you know, and it's just going to be all over the place. So thanks for the honor of, of worshiping with you today and being with you today. We love Kingdom Church and all the amazing things that God is doing here. And, you know, I just want to encourage you as we walk into this next season of, you know, re-entry and returning to church and, and trying to figure out what it all looks like, you know, Matt and all that stuff. Uh, singing is not our only expression of worship. It's one. You know, scripture clearly outlines there's nine or ten, depending on if you want to put two together, because uh, they're pretty close. Uh, there's there's a, a multiplicity of expressions of physical worship. And so if we just come to church and we just sing, then, then really we're doing like one ninth or one tenth of, of what is outlined clearly in scripture. And so we can we can clap, you know, we can declare, we can use our mouth, we can we can bow before the Lord, we can use fully engage with our bodies in so many different ways. So I just want to encourage you, if maybe you're like, hey, I don't feel all the way comfortable singing singing is one expression and you know we've maybe used that as like well if we can't sing how do we get together well listen there's there's a lot of ways we can lift up the name of Jesus and that's what we're going to do here today now we're going to jump into the word uh, if you've got your bible with you I'm going to be in Genesis chapter 35 Genesis 35 I'm going to attempt to make it through 14 verses okay I'm going to I'm going to try I'm going to try. We're going to start with Genesis 35, verse 1. If you're ready, say, I'm ready. I'm ready. Wow, I missed that. Okay, Genesis 35, verse 1. God said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there. Make an altar there to God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. I want you to rise and go to Bethel. Dwell there. Inhabit there. Hang out there. You know, uh, the, the, one of the closest ways we can understand this word, uh, if we go back to the original Hebrew, is that, that there's this old English word, terry, that is used a lot of times when this word shows up. Now, we don't use that word anymore, terry, T-A-R-R-Y, but it literally means uh, to live in expectation. I want you to go to Bethel. I want you to inhabit that place, but I want you to live and expectation. Uh, so I, I have a few confessions to make before we go any further. You know, it's just good to get it off the chest right right at the very beginning. Um, do you, you know, when was the last time you changed the lights on the front of your house? You know what I'm talking about? Like the ones that shine down from your garage. Like mine are kind of tucked up in there, one right above. I'll, I'll tell you, I did change mine, but it took me about two years to do it. Uh, they burnt out, and I was like, you know what? It's fine. Like long summer nights, but then the summers turned into winters, and we would have like Bible studies. We would always do the New Believers Bible study at our house, and people would be walking out, and, and when we do New Believers Bible studies, most people leave at 9, but some people leave at like 10, 10, 30, and so they're just walking out into darkness. Like, there was no light above my door. There was no light on the ground. There, there was just darkness. I, I, we, we literally, they, they went in from proverbial light straight into darkness, and I'm like, you know what? I'm going to get around to do that. I'm going to do that at some point. That's important. I should probably change those lights, but you know, there's other things are more important than changing those lights. It's like, I don't want to get out there. First of all, you get out in the winter. It's too cold. It's cold. It's minus bazillion. We live here. And it's too cold. And you're like, yeah, it's fine. And then I'm like, you know what? I'm going to need a ladder. It's icy. It's probably not a safe working environment. You know, I can't risk. Like, I need to be able to, like, stand up and, and talk in front of people. So, like, I, I just can't put my health at risk in that way. And so, you know, those things would happen. Then summer came. And like, you know, it's too hot. Like, it's plus 29. It's too hot. You know, those two days. It's like, I just can't. I can't. And then the ladder, I'm like, I, you know what? I'm sweating so much. I can slip. It's just a safety hazard. 
you know, just other things just kind of got in the way because it just didn't seem that all important. I got around to it, but it just wasn't that important. You know, this past June, we, we lost my grandpa. And there's moments that you find yourself wishing that you had called one more time, right? That you had visited one more time, that you had had another conversation or another meal or another moment together. But if we're being really honest, it's just there's other things, right? There's things that get in the way, priorities, work, kids. Like, oh, I'm going to get there next week. I'm going to get there next time. I'll make it there, but I, I, I'll, I'll make it there. If we roll it back to Genesis chapter 28, you'll find that Jacob has this moment with God, and he makes a vow. He makes a vow about this place, Bethel. Bethel means house of God. Now, this isn't outside of Jacob's character. I, I know, you know, Pastor Harrison has been talking a little bit about this. He's a little bit of a wheeler, dealer kind of guy. You know, I guess if we had, like, if we had, I don't, I don't want to make a judgment statement based on anyone that's here, but, you know, used car salesman kind of guy. <laughs> like, it's clearly falling apart. And he's like, it's just cosmetic. It's fine. Like, I can't stop. It's fine. It's, the brakes are cheap. And so Jacob's kind of known as this guy who, who, who just kind of always massages the situation. He's like, if you talk to him, like you're getting about 80% of the truth. And then like, there's about 20% of just like manipulation. There's 20% of like emotion. There's, there's all these kinds of things. And so Jacob has this encounter with God. And, he, and this is what he says in, in, in Genesis 28, verse 20. He says, then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear, so that I can come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone which I have set up for a pillar shall be God's house. And, all, and of all that you give me, I will give you a full tenth to you. Now, I'm just going to put this into modern language. God, if you help me in this situation right now, I'm going to give you all my money and I'm going to follow you all the days of my life. Anyone ever prayed one of those prayers before? Hey God, so I'm just in this, <laughs> I've got this test tomorrow at school. I did not study, but if you would bring to my remembrance the things that I heard in that class, I will follow you all the days of my life. I will declare your goodness, and I will give you a tenth of all that I bring into my household, God. And you get into that test, and you fail, and you're like, where were you? He's like, I was with you when you should have been studying. Right? That's the kind of prayer that he makes, so so so. Jacob's kind of wheeling and dealing with God. And so the moment that he makes that vow in Genesis 28 to the moment that he says, arise, let's go up to Bethel in Genesis 35 is 10 years. Because, you know, just other things just get in the way. This is after this moment with Esau where he's worried that Esau is going to wipe him out. He's going to take him out. He's going to just eliminate him. He's like, God, just help me. Keep me safe. I, I, I trust tr God. If you do this one thing for me. I will give you everything. Now, I want us to flip into the New Testament for a moment. In Romans chapter 15, verse 4, the Apostle Paul outlines the importance of the uh, Old Testament. What's the Old Testament going to do for us? It says, for whatever things were written before were written for our learning. So when we examine in this throwback series, the book of Genesis, these things are for our learning. There are things that we can adapt. There's things that we can understand. There's things that we can pull out. In some ways, it's an anthropological journey because we're learning the human nature of people and we're seeing the way that they've interacted with God in the past. And it's, it's almost eerie how people thousands of years ago connect to God in the same way. God, if you would just do this one thing for me. Right? And so these are for our learning, for our knowledge. But it says this, that... We though, or that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. As we walk through seasons in our lives, we have seasons where we require comfort. 
We have seasons where we require patience. And as we study the word of God, we, we will discover both. Maybe it's comfort in the sense of, oh, I've done that. I've been there. And you watch the faithfulness of God once because if he did it then, he can do it again. Maybe there's a season where like, God, when is it going to end? What's the outcome going to be? How am I going to make it through? And we turn back to his word and we see these people and these individuals and these stories and these journeys. And we're like, okay, if they made it, I'm going to make it because I'm following the same God. I'm following him one step at a time. I'm walking with him into the next season. And if Jacob, the deceiver, could make it through, if Jacob could have his name changed, if Jacob could have a, a new trajectory in a, in a new future, then I can too. So we find comfort and patience. I just want to remind you that you only need comfort when you're uncomfortable. And that there are seasons of life that are highly uncomfortable. But it does not mean that Jesus has abandoned you. It does not mean that you are alone. It does not mean that, that he has forgotten about you. It just means he's, he promised he's going to bring comfort. So in the midst of an uncomfortable season, we might be tempted to say, God, where are you? And he's like, I'm right here. Just like I said I would be. And at the same time, there are seasons. And you're like, when is this going to end? He's like, ah, I'm here to develop patience in you. That you don't just rush to the next thing because it satisfies whatever uncomfortability you're experiencing it's interesting that comfort and patience are paired paired together because often when we feel the most uncomfortable is when we make an impulsive move so hold steady take one step follow jesus look to his word he will lead you so jacob and esau meet each other Years after, Jacob was sure his brother wanted to kill him. And so he was actually prepared. If you read the encounter, he sent gifts in his family ahead in waves. The implication there for those who are tracking along is that he's willing to sacrifice a certain amount of his family <laughs> to bring peace. <laughs> and that those who went last were the ones that were most important to him. Do you ever read the Bible that way? That's what he meant. <laughs> so he was convinced that Esau was going to, you know, bring harm to him because he knew what he did to him. Right? You know what he did to him. But that wasn't Esau's response. Es Esau didn't just want, uh, in, like, a formal relationship. He wanted his, his brother back. But Jacob couldn't see that. All he could see was through his lens. All he wanted was a formal relationship. Just this like the formality of we're at peace and you're at peace. And so Esau invites him back, says, come on, come with me, my brother. Let, let's live together. And, he, and Jacob's like, you know what? That, awesome. Yeah, let's do that. Let's do that. You go ahead and I'm going to meet you there. Do you think he met him there? No, nah, he goes to another place called Shechem. Turn, are we allowed to turn to our neighbors? Turn to your neighbor with your mask and very quietly whisper, Shechem. Shechem. He goes to this place called Shechem. Instead of going to meet his brother at Seir, he, he goes to Shechem. Shechem, a place called peace. Isn't it interesting that in the midst of his uncomfortability, Jacob doesn't go where he should have gone. He goes to a place where he thought was going to give him peace. He impulsively makes a decision to not go to the place where he would meet his brother, and not go back to Bethel where he would meet the Lord, a place that he made a vow to return to 10 years earlier. In the midst of different seasons, we, we try and opt out for an option that looks like it's going to give us peace. I guess we could say the grass, it looks like it's greener on the other side. It's a place of peace where I'm like, I'm just going to, I'm going to go there because it just seems like it's, it's just better for me. I guess we could say that the thing or the place that you thought would bring you peace, as we'll discover in scripture, has the potential to also bring you pain. As Jacob and his family were settled there, this is now Genesis 34. Ja Jacob has a beautiful daughter, one of Leah's daughters. 
out. There's this tier system. If you're a child of Rachel, you had two, you know, multiple wives, Rachel and Leah's two sisters. That's just a headache. <laughs> like, wow. He clearly favored Rachel and, and, and her kids more than Leah's. And so he had this daughter, Dinah, she's 14 to 16 years old. And ironically, a guy named Shechem, who's the son of Hamor, who's the king of that region, named after a city, which we're like, that's so weird that you would name after a kid after a city, but I've got a son named Kingston, which is, then you name that, you, you know, your kid London, and you're like, yeah, it's not all that weird. <laughs> Some things never change. So Shechem sees Dinah, and he's like, I want her to be my wife. So he takes her, and this is just trigger warning, takes her, and the Bible dresses it up, and it says that he defiles her. So against her wishes, with no consent, Shechem says, I'm taking that to be mine, and he does. And then he holds her there. And... <laughs> And then they go to Jacob and his sons and say, we want, I just love her so much. He literally says, my soul is tied to her. I love her so much. I can't live another day. Will you give her to be my wife? I mean, that's probably not a way to make that happen. And Jacob tries to negotiate, right? That's in his mind. He's like, I'm just going to negotiate my way out of this. And his sons, his brothers are so mad that they come up with the greatest plan in the history of plans. They go to Shechem and they go to Hamor and they say, okay, guys, we can make a deal here. Just one simple thing. We are Israelites and that means we're all circumcised. So if you're going to marry anyone in our family, every man in your town and in your family, in your control has to be circumcised as well. Adult males. <laughs> and they agree. So they go through this formal process, and the Bible says while they were sore, which is a nice way of saying while they're in recovery, Jacob's sons go in and destroy them all. They kill them all. They're like, you can't fight me now. And they wipe them out, and Jacob's like, what are you doing? We've got, we, we, I made a word. I made, I made a deal. I negotiated us out of this. What are you doing? You brought violence on us. That's the moment that leads us to Genesis 35 verse 1 where Jacob in his desperation calls out to God and God replies, arise and go up to Bethel and dwell there. That's the context. That's the story. All this pain, all this trauma, all this pain that possibly could have been avoided had he gone and done what he said he would do and followed the Lord. But when you go to a secondary place, where you go to a place where you think the grass is greener, where you think you can get out of it easier, where you think you could make the discomfort end by taking the easy way out, even though it's not God's way, it's your way, there is pain that comes through that process. You are looking to avoid the pain and you, there's more that could come on you. We're just, being, we're just being honest, talking about the consequences of our decisions, right? We, we can strip back all the spiritual language. There is consequences to our decisions. This is an uplifting Saturday morning, I have to say. So this is Genesis 35, so now we're at verse 2, right? I said I was going to get through 14, we'll see. Genesis 35, verse 2. So Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, Put away the foreign gods that are among you and purify yourselves and change your garments. In other words, you can't live the way that you were living when we're going to go where we're going to go. Then let us arise and go up to Bethel so that I may make there an altar to God who answers me in the day of my distress. And has been with me wherever I have gone. So they gave to Jacob all the foreign gods that they had and the rings that were in their ears. The rings were largely symbolic of worship. So when they worshiped specific gods, you would put in different piercings. So sometimes when you look and read the context of Old, 
Old Covenant, Old Testament scripture, and they talk about piercings and even tattoos. They were largely talking uh, about it in the sense of literal, like, acts of worship. So they took out all of those things. (laughs) And this is Jacob's solution. He hid them under the terebinth tree that was near Shechem. And as they journeyed, a terror, this is verse 5, a terror from God fell upon the cities that were around them so that they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. When you're walking with Jesus and you're walking into the promise that he has for you, into the plan and into the purpose, there is a supernatural protection that comes with you. He didn't have to fight the entire way. Now, Scripture also tells us in the book of Isaiah that no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Now, we like that one a lot until you realize that the first half says there's going to be a weapon formed against you. (laughs) Right? Like, wait, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. It means you might even get hit. You might even be wounded. You're just not going to die. But there is a supernatural protection that comes on you when you follow Jesus into another season, specifically when he says, listen, in this day, it's time for you to go to here, to here. Now, in this situation, it was going to a physical place, but it could be a place where Jesus is saying, listen, I need you to leave behind that which you're carrying, and I need you to follow me. And when you do that in this season, I'm going to protect you. I'm going to walk with you. That which would have caused you harm in the past will not cause you harm right now because we're walking, you're walking into my promise. You're walking into my purpose. And there are seasons that you can move from place to place. And from moment to moment, and the protection of God is there in a supernatural way. And nothing will come against you. There's a fear that went across the land when Jacob and his sons came through. I think they heard about the circumcision. (laughs) But did you catch it? Did you catch it? Verse 3. Then let us arise and go up to Bethel, to the house of God, so that I may make there an altar to God who answers me in the day of my distress. I guess I could ask you this question today. Where do you go in the day of your distress? you go to a bottle? You go to your ex? Maybe you just go to skip the dishes. Where do you go on the day you're distressed? In your emotional trauma and turmoil and pain, where do you go on the day of your distress? Do you go to somebody else and you just need to, you just need to just dump on somebody else? Did it ever occur to you that the same Jesus that walks with you in your best moments, wants to walk with you in your worst moments. And where do I go in the day of my distress? I find myself at the foot of the cross. I find myself in the presence of Jesus. I find myself pouring my heart out so that the author and the finisher of my faith can can write this story. So he can bring hope and he can bring healing. Where do I go in the day of my distress? Now, I'm going to be honest with you. There's lots of times where I just like, I just want to wallow in the moment, you know? There's something that feels good. I I had one of these days, you know, one of those days. And it's like 10 o'clock at night. Our house was quiet. Finally got the boys to bed. And I just went downstairs for a moment because I just wanted to feel sorry for myself. I just wanted to feel all the feels. Because sometimes it feels good to feel sorry for yourself. You're like, wow, your life is hard. You don't deserve this. And then this old song popped into my head. Anyone know I Exalt Thee? Anyone know that song? For thou, O Lord, art high above all the earth. For thou art exalted high above all gods. And I was like, oh, shoot. In this moment, I I made myself a god. Because I exalted my problem and my circumstance above Jesus. 
I said, man, this thing has more power in my life than Jesus. This thing has more power over my mood than Jesus. This thing, this thing, this thing, those people, those emotions, that vibe has more power over my heart and my life than the Savior of the universe who died on a cross for me that I could live. Hold on, for thou, O Lord, it's Psalm 97, are high above all the earth. You're high above my emotional distress and I don't have to just handle it in whatever way that I know how to handle it. I can come to you. Isaiah 55 says that his ways are higher than he, our ways. His thoughts are more than we can even imagine for ourselves. That's the Bible, Isaiah 55. You think you can imagine for yourself a bright future. Just imagine the, the future that Jesus has in store for you. So when I feel the weight and the pressure in the day of my distress. I don't go to my friends. I don't go to my phone and start texting. I don't go to those places first. I come to Jesus and say, Lord, I'm, I need you. I'm going to come and dwell and live in expectation that you're going to walk with me through this season. And though I'm in pain right now, you're going to turn it around for your good. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. And if I'm in the wrong, then I'm going to apologize. And you're going to give me the courage and the strength to do that. But if I'm in the right, you are my great defender. And though I don't know how I'm going to get myself out of it, I know that your ways are higher than anything that I could imagine. Any plan that I could come up with, any settlement that Jacob could negotiate Jesus I'm going to come to you in the day of my distress because you created me you declare me to be your masterpiece and not only that you declare that I am your inheritance so you love me more than I love me you know me better than I know me I'm going to trust you Four, they gave Jacob all their idols, all their gods, all the things that they put in front of the one true God. Now we might not have idols or statues or gold rings, but we got dreams and ideas. We've got relationship goals that may or may not be aligned with the plans and purposes that God has for you. I got a career. I've got status, things that I want to achieve in my life. Let me ask you this question. What are you holding on to from your past? holding you back from your future. Because just like God the Father, Yahweh called Jacob for, he said, arise, come to my house, dwell here and live with expectation. Jesus is here today and he's saying the same thing to you. And in the same way we respond that Jacob and his household did, we take the things from our past we lay them at the foot of the cross. We give them to Jesus and we say, Jesus, these are the things that I'm putting in front of you and I'm letting go of them right now because you've got a bright and a brilliant future in front of me and I'm gonna let go of my plans. I'm gonna get let go of my status symbols. I'm gonna let go of those things. Now may I say none of those things are necessarily inherently evil, but the moment that they're elevated above the name of Jesus, your life is out of alignment and you're actually worshiping another God. So Jacob had these two moments, one where he laid down Bethel, first time, put his head on a stone, and he had this dream, you know, Jacob's ladder of angels in heaven, just this moment. He had another moment, I believe Pastor Harrison shared about, he was wrestling in 
theological terms, those are called nocturnal theophanies. <laughs> Things that happen in the night. Nocturnal theophany coupled with a new word, Christophany, where Jesus shows up in the Old Testament. I say all that to say, Jesus is near at night. And though it might feel like you're in the midst of a night season right now, it might feel like it's dark. Can I tell you, joy comes in the morning. But Jesus is near at night. He's near in the darkness. He's near in the blackness, the dark night of the soul. Jesus is near. Jesus is here right now. It's not an accident that you're even here listening to this message. He wants to remind you that he can speak hope and life into your situation even when you did not expect it. Here's what I want us to do. I'm going to invite you to stand to your feet. We're going to sing this song together. Or we're going to whisper it or hum it. Whatever's safe in COVID times. But I want to invite you to do something. I want to invite you to engage in worship in a way that is different from your normal pattern. Because it's a new day, it's a new moment, it's a new season. What we took for granted, we can't necessarily do it in the same way. And in the same way, Jesus is calling you into a new season and there's a new response that's required with a new season. So if you're someone who normally just likes to sing and take it in, I'm gonna encourage you to do something bold and it might feel drastic and it might feel uncomfortable. I'm gonna invite you to lift your hand. That's a universal sign of surrender. You know, someone's holding, holding you up. They're going to mug you. You put your hands up in the air. This is a moment of surrender. For others of you who you feel like that's a comfortable expression, I'm going to suggest you can try bowing before the Lord. You know, when royalty comes into the room, we don't have many of them, but you, you bow in a certain way. Can I tell you, King Jesus is already in the room. We can worship and respond in a different way. There's other, others of us who just need to sit. We just need to sit and take it in and drink it in. This, is, this, is a, this requires a physical response. Because the physical response that we take, the next step that we take right here, right now, is representative of a shift, of a shift in our souls. Say, Jesus, I'm forgetting the past changing my clothes I'm burying those things under a tree at the cross of Calvary and I'm trusting you in this next season I'm trusting you in this next moment I'm trusting you with what comes next Jesus I lay aside my plans I lay aside my purposes and I align my heart to yours today from this moment forward I declare that in the day of my distress I don't turn to any other mechanism but you Jesus I set my eyes on you and right now I declare that you are the king of kings and the lord of lords and there's no one beside you there's no one that compares to you there's nobody that can, take, can contain you and so I submit myself to you Jesus I surrender myself to you my situation whatever your pain is just lay it down Whatever your anger is, lay it down. Whatever your disappointment is, lay it down. Jesus wants to come and bring hope and healing and life.